so that regulators, both in Canada and the United States, are in fact saying, please don't use traffic shaping if you can possibly avoid it. Instead, try to use pricing. If your networks are congested, charge them more. Put a cap, put a limit on there. At the same time that the United States, with 300 million people, is moving away from all you can eat, guess which crazy, wacky country is thinking about it? Us. This is not a surprise. Um, the folks at uh, bottom right there, uh, Wind, uh, all formerly known as Global Life, uh, Tony Lacavera's uh, new startup, uh, not here, of course, in Montreal, but they are talking about all-you-can-eat data. Um, and it apparently really, we don't know yet, but they are thinking of offering it. The challenge for this is that if that happens, it would not surprise me um, as new entrants come in with less than a half percent market share, having spent billions of dollars on a network, if they don't start doing some kind of crazy things to encourage people to move to their network. So the challenge here as a telecom provider is, are we gonna see not so much a price war, are we gonna see a data war in Canada? And I think it's looking like we could see that. Now as consumers, of course, we should all be jumping up and down and dancing, uh, but, but I think as the US lesson points out, all you can eat data is really fun until it stops working. So let's keep that in mind as we see this going along. But our prediction in 2010 is that all you can eat is gonna be phased out in the United States, which is a big deal. One of the reasons that's a big deal is that these networks are collapsing. When you were in San Francisco with an iPhone, you can't get a signal. And I don't mean you can't watch the Super Bowl on your iPhone, I mean you can't make phone calls. Same with New York. Las Vegas at the Consumer Electronics Show, once again, huge problems. So here's where, so I asked a, a Canadian company to give me a small light device that I could carry across eight cities across Canada and then through France and Israel and they very kindly gave me. On the other hand, I don't need to do any weightlifting, so. Does anybody know what this is? <laughs> I like that, it's, you know, if you thought the tablet was hard to use, this is even harder, yeah. So one of the challenges with these networks is, hmm, one of the challenges is that there will be 4G networks. There will be LTE, there will be WiMAX, but those won't be installed across the United States or Canada or Europe until 2013, 2014. Meanwhile, we've got all these people out there who are buying smartphones who are buying tablets and netbooks, who maybe don't have all you can eat, but even five gig a month is an awful lot of data. Putting this over these networks is an incredible technological challenge. Not so much, I'll use Montreal examples, uh, you know, out in West Island and Point Claire, you know what, if more people start using data, you stick up another tower. In New York City, there are no more towers to put up. You know, they're already seven feet apart, you can't put one in between, right? At this point, you're easier just yelling at people. Um, same in San Francisco, same in London, same I'm sure probably in downtown Montreal. How do you make that network run more efficiently? There's a couple of ways you can do it. Uh, this is one example. One of the challenges is in backhaul. The uh, towers are usually connected over T1 phone lines that aren't very fast. If you could have a better backhaul, so here's a plug, Canadian company. This is a dragon wave, microwave uh, antenna. So remember I talked about telecom growth this year was going to be 3 or 4%? Dragon Wave's revenues are up 400% year over year. That's not an advertisement for the stock. I'm just saying there are pockets of growth and there are other companies in this area. Uh, other Canadian companies like Sandvine uh, has this kind of technology that makes networks run better. Uh, certainly uh, there's Wi-Fi companies as well. Uh, software companies like Bridgewater that does policy management. But here's an example of, uh, this is a slide that I've seen and I've blanked out the name because I don't want to talk about who it is, but this is just the kind of stuff that we're seeing. Imagine uh, software that you could put in your network and as you can see, it offers you bandwidth savings. This is just one example of the kind of stuff I'm talking about that offers uh, uh, potentially to, to phone companies and cable companies and wireless companies thousands of percent ability to get more customers on the network. It's the same reason that Alcatel Lucent's in trouble today. It's the same reason that Ericsson doesn't make as much money as it used to. It's the same reason that Siemens isn't making as much money. It's the reason that Marconi went, went away. And the answer is that uh, anybody here ever hear of the, it's a guy from Deloitte called Michael Rayner, innovative disruption. 
innovative disruption is when a technology that isn't that good competes against a technology that's really amazing. And at first, it's dismissed as a toy. It's not good enough. But it gets better over time. And it gets a little bit better and a little bit better. And then one day, all of a sudden, it turns out that good enough is good enough. And what we saw in the world of, and that's one of the reasons driving netbooks, by the way, is the same idea that who needs a $1,000 machine when all I want it for is web surfing? In the telecom world, what happened is the, the Nortel equivalent of these used to sell for $300,000. Um, they now sell them for about $15,000. That kind of disruption of an industry can change the dynamics and the profitability of an industry for decades.